Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We'll just give you a moment to um, join in. My name is Mary Ann Monteleone. I'm Vice President of Professional Development, and we are here today with LIBOR's Wednesday webinar. We have two very special guests back with us today, Steve Harney and David Childers of KCM, which is Keeping Current Matters. We have a huge turnout for them today and um, we're happy that you're with us. So we'll give you another minute, uh, if not 30 seconds, cause it's 12 o'clock, we like to start on time. Just get everybody um, settled in and we'll begin. If you just joined in, welcome. My name is Mary Ann Monteleone. I'm Vice President of Professional Development, and today is LIBOR's Wednesday webinar, 2021 Housing Market Update with KCM, which is Keeping Current Matters. Um, we have two very special guests back with us today, and I'd like to introduce them um, informally and then formally. When um, COVID first happened, I reached out to Steve Harney at KCM and he was quick to put some data together and provide the realtors, LIBOR realtors with some information and uh, rose to the occasion immediately. Shortly after that, provided another webinar for brokers and managers, another one for agents. And here we are almost 10 months later back with David and uh, Steve. So let me tell you a little bit about them and then I'll turn it over to them. Steve Harney is the founder of, and chief content creator of Keeping Current Matters, has been quoted in major news sources and was recognized as one of the 100 most influential leaders in real estate by Inman and as one of the 200 most powerful um, people in real estate by Swanepoel Organization. Uh, David is the Vice President and Content Marketing um, at Keeping Current Matters. He's a contributor. He has kept his finger on the pulse of the real estate industry for more than 20 years and regularly contributes to Keeping Current Matters with market insights through various webinars, podcasts, and videos. They did an extensive amount of research to customize this presentation for our marketplace, Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. So without further delay, welcome back guys, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mary Ann. We're excited to be here today, and thanks for, for having Steve and I back. Um, it, is, it is good to be with you, and you know, thank you for your leadership through this. Uh, you know, there's not many uh, chances that Steve and I get to be on a webinar where we can say, you know, from day one, when, when Keeping Current Matters was started, um, LIBOR and you, Marianne, have supported what we've done. So we're grateful for that and grateful for your leadership um, in our industry and, and uh, with what we do. And you're right, we spoke, you know, uh, back when the pandemic started, and many of you probably were, were on that webinar. And we, we talked about, you know, how to navigate this market. We're going to talk about, you know, the 2021 market. And you know, at KCM, we get a chance to do these webinars and uh, had a chance to do a webinar yesterday. And, you know, one of the attendees asked a really good question that I'll, I'll share with you as we kind of start off today. And, and she asked it and she said, you know, how do we move forward in our businesses given everything going on in the world? And, you know, certainly 2020 threw so many things at us from the, the pandemic to unemployment to racial injustice and, and all the things that we know about last year. And, and now we're here in, in 2021 in a situation with political turmoil and, and all the things that we know at hand, the pandemic still uh, alive and well and, and going on. And you know, I think there is an answer to that question. And the answer is found for, for our business by controlling what we can control. Now, I'm not saying that in suggesting we turn a blind eye to everything happening, but I am saying, let's talk about what we can control and the role we play uh, in the housing market. Because I think where we are, uh, Marianne, is a tribute to all the things that you had us come in and talk about and great agents uh, across this country and certainly uh, in LIBOR have done the work over the past year um, uh, to, to help folks see how they can safely 
uh, you know, move, buy a home and, and all the things they've needed to do through this. And so we're grateful for, for all the hard work that you do. But our goal today is to give you some of the insights uh, into the market right now. Steve's going to come on in just a minute and talk exactly and specifically about your market. I'm going to give you some of the higher level look of uh, you know, the U.S. real estate market, all with the goal that you would be equipped with the insights to help confidently guide your clients forward. And, and you know, in the world that we live today, that is uh, what people are looking for is, is somebody that has the confidence and the knowledge to be able to help them make the, the, the wisest decision for them and their family. So as we start off here, here's what I would remind you of. We, we were together 10 months ago and, and we talked about all the reasons this is in 2008 all over again, if you remember that, everything from home price appreciation and literal differences in the market, the amount of inventory that we had in the housing crash as compared to the lack of supply uh, that we see in the market today. And even back then, we still see lack of supply and saw it uh, 10 months ago as well. The, the way that, that uh, you know families had handled equity since the housing crash, since how, how they handled it prior to the, to the crash and, and really how they handled it, uh, you know, leading up to this crash. And, and oh, by the way, if there was one thing that we look back on 2020 in the housing market, the one thing that helped to get a lot of people through and helped us avoid a lot of things was equity. And we're going to talk about that. And you know, we talked about the amount of equity that people have. You know, this slide, if, if it rings a bell or you remember it, $177,000 before we started the pandemic was the average equity in a home in this country with a mortgage on it. That number today has risen to $194,000 in equity. And so, you know, as we look back on that, a lot of you took this information, you got out there and you helped your clients with it. And, uh, and, and to see that has just been amazing. You know, I, I want to bring you a little perspective in from showing time from their positive takeaways from 2020 report. And they said this, Market data has always been a powerful tool for real estate, but 2020 marked a new high point for how data was, le data was leveraged to encourage informed decisions and to help real estate professionals reinforce their status as market experts. And that's exactly what, what many of you did. And if you remember, we, we, we started this off saying, hey, you know, we're uh, we're going into a recession here. Economists are calling for that, and we went into a recession. But recession does not equal housing crisis. And, and we use this slide starting back in March of last year to say, okay, in the last five recessions, what happened in this country? You know, we all remember the housing crisis where homes depreciated by almost twenty percent. Well, now we have the data to to say what actually happened, and we can confidently say. Uh, today that recession does not equal housing crisis. And according to CoreLogic, uh, homes appreciated 8.2% over the last year. And if we look at the last six recessions, four of the six times homes appreciated, three of those four times over 6%. And so, you know, having that information and, and those of you that brought that information to your clients, being able to come back and say, look, we were right. What, we, what you told, what, what we told you was right. And a recession doesn't equal housing crisis. And so I think the key going forward is going to be to continue to bring these insights uh, to, the, to the families, the clients, the folks that you serve, uh, so they can confidently make uh, you know, wise decisions about their housing. You know, if we were in the KCM office, uh, there's, there's a wall that's uh, there right when you walk in that says, we believe every family uh, should feel confident when buying and selling a home. And that's what drives all we do. I, I do want to say one thing before I turn it over to Steve to talk specifically about your market. If you want access to this type of information every day on an ongoing basis, I want to invite you to go to Try KCM and start a free 14 day trial. There you can see everything that we offer from, you know, the blog post every day that you could personalize to social media content to, uh, you know, buyer and seller guides each quarter. Everything you need to deliver these insights to the clients you serve. So if you haven't done that, we want to invite you on that. We love being a part of everything LIBOR is doing and, uh, and grateful for the support. I want you to know we'd love to have you on that journey. So Steve, I want to invite you in here. and Let's talk a little bit uh, about the market uh, here. All right, let's just leave that slide for now, David. 
And yeah. I just want to say hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Marianne, thank you very much for inviting us back. Appreciate it tremendously. And they do have it a little bit mixed up. I am definitely the founder of KCM, but it kind of led them to believe that David works for me. I want everyone to understand I work for David now. So my company and my son, and David's done a phenomenal job over the last 10 months helping the country, including you, uh, to try to get their hands around what's actually happening in the world and how that was going to impact residential real estate in the country. All right, so let's take a look now at, you know, one of the things that people always tell me when for the last 12 years, whether it be virtually, whether it be in person, I'm in front of agents, and every agent in every town, every city, every location I went to said, well, you don't understand, Steve, this market is different. And I could be somewhere in, you know, one part of Brooklyn and then go to a different part of Brooklyn and they'll say, well, this part of Brooklyn is different. I could be, you know, in one part of Suffolk County and then go to a different, it, it, everything's different. And I always kind of chuckle inside saying, well, overall, most markets are kind of running the same way. Interest rates are running the same way. When we had the foreclosure crisis, that was running the same way. But this is the first time I can actually say I'm talking to a group where, yes, you're right, your market is different. So David, why don't we go to that first slide to explain that or help explain that. This is housing inventory, where we stand as a country, we're down 39.6% since, since the same time last year. So we broke it down by state for this presentation, so we understood. Every state that's yellow is really in a bad spot. Any state in red is even in a worse spot. And in that deep red, that blood red, is even in a worse spot than that. Now, there are two states that are not in any of those categories. They're blues, blue. One is Hawaii, and that's because people are continuing to list their houses in Hawaii, but no one's getting in a plane to fly over there to buy one of them. All right, and that's why their inventory is up. And the other one is New York, where inventory is not, is down, not down as much as it is across the rest of the country. Again, the average in the current country is almost 40% less inventory today than the same time last year. But in New York, you're only down about 1%. So there's definitely a difference between what's happening in your market and what's happening in the rest of the country. Now we could talk about different reasons for that. Probably the primary reason is what's caused this tremendous lack, one of the major reasons has caused this tremendous lack of inventory is we're in the middle of a pandemic. And very obviously New York had hit the hardest and first before we even understood what was happening, you got hit. Your governor was very, very strict and let's not get into politics about whether he should have been as strict or not as strict. That's not what we're here to discuss. But he was very strict in what he did and for some period of time compared to the rest of the country, not only did you have one hand tied behind your back, you had both hands tied behind your back and that impacted the real estate market. There's no doubt about that. But as the, the pandemic got a little bit better going through the summer, you started to recover. And now you're on, you're coming back the other side of that. Are you slower than the rest of the country? Yes, because you got hit hard and you got hit first. Everyone else could learn from what you did and learn from what happened in New York. So let's take a look at it and break it down by county. Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. This is the sole property average price, year over year percentage change. This time this year versus the same time last year. What we can see that in both Brooklyn and Queens, you had a little bit of a bump up on the average sales price. Not much at all. Where the rest of the country was seeing double digit increases in pricing. Nassau County went up a little bit. All right, and is heading in the right direction as they all are. And Suffolk County is like, breaking it out. Now, there's a little bit about the, you know, the average sales price I want everybody to understand. One of the major reasons that Suffolk County is you know, increasing in average sales price as dramatically as they are, is average means of all the houses sold, what's the average price? What winds up taking place is we can remember this time last year, going into or the end, the last quarter of last year, those big houses, those vacation homes, those second homes, they weren't, you know, that market was actually slow. The luxury market was slow. Well, guess what happened in starting in March and April? Everyone wanted one of those big houses as far away from any city in the country as they could get. 
So now the part of the reason that prices in that in Suffolk County have skyrocketed is not that each individual house is going up by 20%, but what is happening is they're selling more and more houses out in the Hamptons, out on the North Fork, and those houses just get a higher price point. So they're, since they're selling more at a higher priced homes, the average sales price, because the cohort, the, the, the type of home that's being sold is changing. So part of that is that, and part of it is supply and demand. Because definitely out in, and we'll look at this in a second, out in uh, Suffolk County, um, the demand is still remaining strong when not as much it is in the other three counties. So let's take a look at that. This is the average sold property counts year over year percentage change. Again, we're looking this year versus last year, each one of these months. So what could we see? Well, Brooklyn started out real strong. You finished last year really strong and you started this year very strong. But then all of a sudden something happened in March that all of a sudden you started to drop like a rock. And we all know what that was. The reaction to the pandemic and it affected every one of the counties. Every one of the counties that saw a dramatic increase as did the rest of the country. Now the interesting thing is the rest of the country came back in May and June. But again, you were first, you lost a tremendous amount of people and there was a major lockdown. So your recovery in Brooklyn and Queens, closer to you know, the city part, the urban part of uh, your market, uh, that hasn't recovered as quickly, all right? But they are, you can see in both of them, they're swinging back up. If you take a look at uh, 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 Nassau and Suffolk, they're coming back in sold property counts to where they were last year. And any one of us in your market would like to have 2019 back all over again. <laughs> all right, so we're coming back to where we were last year. The rest of the country is well ahead of where we were last year, but you're coming back to those numbers. Now that's sold property, so we know they're 60 and 90 days behind schedule. And in your marketplace, it might even be 120 days because you have lawyers involved and it's a lot more uh, you know, um, paperwork and things that have to be worked through. Uh, in uh, New York than maybe some of the other states where the process is a little bit simpler. But if we go to pendant sales, we can see a little bit different story because this is more timely. This is more, and what we're seeing is that in April and May, I right, was still falling, but then in June and July, everyone started to pick up again. We don't have Brooklyn numbers, not because we didn't want to put them up, ladies and gentlemen, but one key doesn't separate the Brooklyn numbers with your real accurate numbers we felt comfortable sharing. But we could guess that Brooklyn is gonna be somewhere as it has in the last two slides, be somewhere around where Queens is. Meaning you're making the comeback, but the comeback isn't as quick as it is in Nassau and Suffolk County. So all four boroughs, or I should say, uh, all four counties, Kings County, Queens County, Nassau and Suffolk, all four of them are making the comeback now. That's the most important thing. You're headed in the right direction. Will this second wave, this you know, challenge that we're up against now, will that cause another downturn? Most economists don't believe so. Because the other thing that we have going for us, there is light at the end of the tunnel. People are being vaccinated. My mother-in-law looks like she's scheduling an appointment for next week to be vaccinated. So what winds up taking place is as more and more people get vaccinated, as, more, as the numbers start dropping instead of rising, all of a sudden, your market is going to open wide open. All right, it's going to it's going to explode, and you have to be ready for that explosion. All right, and I believe that's going to take place in each one of the four counties. Now you have different opportunities in the different counties. So let's go to the next set. They don't separate Brooklyn and Queens out, so I put them together, and that's the reason I put Nassau and Suffolk, Suffolk County together. And let's take a look what this slide is actually saying. It's existing inventory counts, 2019 and now. The comparison. So what do we know? Where the virus impacted the marketplace most, Brooklyn, Queens, what winds up taking place, you have more inventory now than you, do in the, than you did the same time last year. That's why you seem sluggish. That's why you're saying, well, I have a listing. It really should sell and it might not sell. 
We'll talk as David goes through this a little bit, but I will tell you that if you're in Brooklyn and Queens and someone needs to sell, they have to put it at a price that will compel somebody to buy it. We have a saying for that. If you need, if you want to be selling, your price has to be compelling. And Brooklyn and Queens right now, that's the case. If they could wait it out a little bit, I do think relief is around the corner. By mid-year, that extra inventory, you're going to celebrate that because that's what you're going to be selling. Now, in Nassau and Suffolk, they have a different challenge, different opportunity. They have plenty. They've already seen their market come back. They have a lot of demand. That's why the inventory is being bitten into and eaten into. All right. So we're right now, they're happy that they're selling so many houses. By mid-year, they're going to have a real lack of inventory that's going to slow them up. So what is their opportunity in Nassau and Suffolk? To go get more listings. The opportunity in Brooklyn, Queens is to list those properties at the right price. The ones you currently have, list them at the right price. If the people need to sell. And the opportunity in Nassau and Suffolk is go get more listings. You're going to need them, baby. You're going to need them in a big way. Now, I wanted to give you an explanation of why your market's different in some parts of the, uh, almost all the rest of the country outside of Hawaii, almost the whole rest of the country. But there are some things that are going to be the same. Same challenges are going to be faced by everyone in the country. And David's going to go through those right now. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I think the, you know, the question in talking about challenges is, what are the experts saying about the 2021 housing market? You know, what are they saying about what's ahead of us? You know, if we turn on the news or, or read things, you know, experts are saying it's going to be, uh, you know, a good market for real estate. But I'll try to break that down a little bit and give you some context around uh, what experts are saying uh, about the market. And let's start here with a quote from Frank Martel, who's the CEO of CoreLogic. Um, he says this, the housing market performed remarkably well in 2020, despite the volatile economic state, talking about the U.S. housing market all over the country. While we can't expect to see lingering effects of COVID-19 resurgences and subsequent shutdowns in the early months of 2021, vaccine distributions and stimulus action should revitalize economic activity and keep home purchase demand and home price growth strong. What's he saying there? Really, you know, the, the the pandemic and everything we we went through last year for real estate. You know, a lot of people said there, there are different things we want in a home, and there, you know, the the market overall performed very very well. But Steve just mentioned the you know the light at the end of the tunnel. Now now we've got to get through the tunnel to get there. But on the other side, there experts are saying you know as as vaccinations happen as you know, different things happen, revitalized economic activity, the challenges that people have had with unemployment um, will come back. And, you know, with that strong demand and housing, you know, if we look at what experts are saying about prices, um, experts are calling for, you know, healthy appreciation going into uh, this year and, and throughout the year, 3.9% home price appreciation on average. And you can see the range there, anywhere from 6% on one end, 2% on the other. And um, you know, we saw great appreciation in the real estate market in the past year, largely due to uh, lack of uh, supply and increased demand. Price is always going to be a factor of supply and demand. Steve just talked about that in two very you know, you know, good examples to show that, two different markets. And, and really, if we want to break this down and say, okay, what, what, are, what are they saying about home price? Well, experts expect more supply to come into the market uh, in, the, in the coming year, driven by, by trends. Now, if you want a lot of that, uh, that information, uh, we did a webinar yesterday at KCM talking about those trends and the trends that will dominate the market. I spent an hour on uh, on that topic, and you can go get that there. We're not going to go deep on those, but, but there are trends that are that are set up by last year's market that will bring more supply uh, into uh, into housing across the country. You know, David, I think, if I, I could jump in there just on yeah, this. Go ahead, one. Steve. And remember what we were just talking about. If you're in Suffolk County, that six percent is closer to your number. If you're in Brooklyn, that two percent is closer to your number. If yeah. you're in Nassau or, or uh, Queens, those middle numbers are closer to your number. That's what winds up taking place. David's 100% right, supply and demand. 
Demand in Brooklyn and Queens is going to skyrocket once this thing gets straightened out. But you already have a lot of supply, so your prices are not going to go crazy. And in that uh, Suffolk County, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to catch the amount of demand versus the amount of supply. You know, you're not going to be able to list enough houses to keep up with the number of buyers that are still looking to buy. So your prices are going to stay, are going to uh, increase more dramatically than they will further in. That will level off by the end of the year, but going into the year, that's what we see. Yeah, I, th I think that point is, uh, is, you know, such a good point as we look at what's coming up and helping people make those decisions. The other thing is, you know, affordability. And I, and I want to use a quote here from Lawrence Yoon, and he says this, housing affordability, which had greatly benefited from falling mortgage rates, are now being challenged due to record high home prices. That could place strain on some potential consumers and particularly first time buyers. Now, in that we've seen, uh, you know, in 2020, according to Freddie Mac, we hit a low in the average 30 year fixed uh, mortgage rate 16 times last year. I mean, the, and I'm going to show you in just a minute just that what that looks like visually. Where we stand today uh, at the 30 year fixed is 2.65% uh, is the average across this country on a 30 year fixed. Now, I'm not here today to, to start to say let's forecast rates or try to predict where they're going. I, I will tell you there are rumblings of people talking about, okay, you know, alerts to lock. And the overall forecast is that, that we'll see those rise as the economy improves. But but, but really looking at this and saying, okay, we've benefited from these rates. And, you know, as we go forward, that could place strain on some folks that are, that are thinking about uh, buying. And I'm going to give you a specific example here as we wrap up in just a minute uh, about this. The, the other thing I think we have to look at too is those that maybe are renting that want to buy uh, have been particularly strained in this downturn. We know that the um, you, you know the impact of uh, the COVID pandemic has definitely disproportionately impacted those on the lower end yeah. of the earning scale and may have eaten into the uh, you know the ability to you know the money they had for a down payment and, and being able to go out and actually buy a home and so talking about all the things like it doesn't take 20% to buy a home in, in the market today and all the benefits of you know down payment assistance or things that people are going to need in the coming year that have been affected uh, and, and you know that housing affordability is going to be an issue for. And so I think it's something we need to remember as we go throughout the year. But if we look at mortgage rates, uh, this is a forecast from Freddie Mac. And, you know, I, I'll talk just a minute about the specific numbers, but if you just look at this visually and see where we've been in 2019 through 2020 and where we're projected going into this year. Now, Freddie Mac's saying, you know, we're, we're going to stay around 3% going throughout the year. I would not be surprised if we go through that and some of those get uh, you know bumped up a little bit, but we should be in a very good interest rate environment throughout the year. You know, if we look at historically, if you were to say even, you know, if we're talking about 3% for a 30 year fixed, if that were to go up to three and a half percent, that's still a great rate on a, you know, on a home mortgage for, a, you know, a lock-in period of 30 years. I think we get, you know, those of us that have been in the business and, you know, what that's been in the past can go, yeah, that's a great rate. Now, it will have an impact on consumers that we'll talk about, but as we look forward into the year, overall, we should stay in a in a very attractive, very good rate environment in this country. And what's that going to do? It's going to spur more people that say now is the time to buy a home. And, and experts agree with this. If we look at the transaction uh, forecast for 2020 to over 2021, each one of these forecasters are projecting more homes sold. Now, I filtered out a few of the uh, the forecasters out of this that maybe deal in just existing homes and don't add new homes, but I can tell you across the board, forecasters are saying we're going to sell more homes this year than we did last year. You know, by the way, we sold more homes in 2020 than we did in 2019 during the midst 
of a, of a global pandemic and certainly uh, in, in very hard hit markets. So as we stay in this, in this environment, as we, as we really, um, you know, this low interest rate environment and people, you know, look at what they need in a home, a lot of them are saying, you know what, uh, now is the time and we need to make a move. A lot of them have said, you know what, we didn't make a move last year because of fear, uh, health fears and, and not saying those aren't legitimate. Um, but, but as we go through the year, people feel more confident as we articulate and communicate, this is how we can sell a home safely for you. Um, expect to see more and more people say, you know what, we put off making that decision and, and, and we're going to go ahead and move forward that given the, the low interest rates, given all the things that, that we know. But, but here's the bottom line, and it comes from, from Freddie Mac, and, and Lynn says this, if you found a home that fits your needs at a price you can afford, it might be better to act now rather than wait for the future rate declines that may never come true in a future that likely holds very tight inventory. You know, the challenge uh, in our business of a year of low rates is, you know, buyers become complacent and say, well, you know, if they're not going to go up a lot, then I'm just going to wait. And maybe they'll go down even a little bit further and I'll wait for that. And I'll catch that, you, you know, that, that low rate when it happens. And, and we see Freddie Mac saying the exact opposite, that now is the time to act if you want to take advantage of the market and the low rates. And I think that's the, the message we need to be sending out, certainly uh, to folks uh, in, in the right way that, that are thinking about a decision. You know, maybe, maybe talking to everybody that, hey, did you think about selling your home last year, but put that off? Have you thought about buying a home and, and put that off? And being able to answer those questions and show them that now is the time uh, if they're thinking about making that decision. You know, I think another question that, is certainly on the minds uh, of, of a lot of us in, in our business, but also a lot of com uh, consumers is this question of, will we see a wave of foreclosures in the coming year? Now, this is a topic at KCM that we have been diligent about uh, over the last, gosh, six months uh, talking through what is happening in uh, in forbearance. That's the, the tool that's been given by uh, the federal government to help how, uh, homeowners weather this storm relative to their housing. You know, we didn't have this back in the housing crash. And, and, and you know, as we look at the pandemic and those that have been affected, it's a tool to help them, you know, be able to get from one side to the other. And if you remember uh, the, w the way this conversation started out is that, you know, all these people are going to go into forbearance and every one of them is going to turn into a foreclosure and we're going to have a mess on our hands and it's going to be 2008 all over again. And what I'm going to show you is what actually is happening in the country didn't pan out this way. Now, I think there are some lessons and some things that we need to take note and it really underscores the job that we have right now uh, in the market uh, relative to those that are in forbearance and uh, in the families literally that we're able to help uh, through this. I'll, I'll start here with, with a quote from CoreLogic. Uh, Yanling Mayer says this, distributional analysis of foreborn loan payment statuses reveal, foreborn loan, meaning those that are in forbearance, reveal that nearly more than one third, 39.1% of all foreborn loans are now 150 plus days behind payment. While as many as one in four, 25.5% are 180 plus days past due. Why is this important? You know, we're dealing in numbers here that truthfully we haven't seen in, in past dues. And many of you are familiar with, with seriously delinquent. You know, when someone goes seriously delinquent, the cure rate or the ability to make that back up goes down dramatically traditionally in our business because if you couldn't make your payment for three months, how are you going to expect to, to make up that payment and get back on track? This is different right now. Remember, this is a tool that's been given uh, to homeowners to help them weather the storm. And while these delinquencies are certainly high, the, the, the tools that are in place are meant to work for these homeowners. And we're going to talk in just a minute about what's actually happening there. What are people doing as they come out? of forbearance. But to give you a perspective, there's still people entering forbearance, there's still people using it, and it's doing the job, I would say, that uh, was intended for it. If we look at those that are in active forbearance right now, it's really is interesting. You know, we look over the last several weeks, even going back into, into November, we've kind of bounced around, uh, around 2.75 million uh, you know, mortgages in forbearance, uh, up a couple of weeks, down a couple of weeks, up a couple of weeks, most recently down uh, this, this past week of reporting. What does that say? 
since people are still accessing it, people are still, you know, using the tool that was designed to help them. You, you know, uh, as we rolled into November last year, there were reports that there were people that were delinquent uh, on their mortgage that hadn't accessed uh, forbearance. And my hope is that that some of those numbers and ticking up, maybe that's that's folks that that needed it that hadn't been in it for one reason or another. They didn't know about it. They didn't have the time to go out and literally talk to their bank about what they can do. And, and, and my hope is that the that tool continues to help home, homeowners weather the, the storm financially with regard to their housing. Now, the question on a lot of people's minds is, what are we going to see a wave of foreclosures? If you want a really good uh, piece of information to share with your clients, go to the KCM blog today. We have a, a blog on that topic that you're able to share with the uh, buyers and sellers that you serve, consumers, share it on your Facebook page, whatever social media, however you share it, uh, and get that information out there. There's a great article today on the KCM blog about this topic. Because here's the here's what it comes down to. It's a quote from Michael Sklar's at Collateral Analytics says this, we may very well see a meaningful increase in the number of homes listed for sale as these borrowers choose to sell at what is arguably an intermediate top in the market and downsize to more affordable homes rather than face foreclosure. So what he's saying here is we will see an increase in the number of people that are affected by forbearance. We don't see this as a, as a wave of foreclosures, but, but we do see those people bringing those homes to market. Now, what, what is the, the thing that we want to go back and remember? I want to go back to the slide that I showed you earlier, uh, and I'm not going to go to it here, but remind you that. Remember I said, according to CoreLogic, $194,000 is the average equity on a home in this country with a mortgage. You know, equity was the, the, the star, if you will, of the housing market last year and allowing people to either tap that equity, sell their home, do whatever they needed to do that we really literally didn't have back in the housing crisis. People were underwater, they owed more on the home than it was worth, and they had to walk. And we we had an oversupply and we ended up with a ton of homes uh, that nobody, you know, at that point, we, the market couldn't consume. And we're in a very, very different uh, situation today where we're in an undersupply market for most of the country, given the nuances that Steve's talked about, and we have people that have handled their equity dramatically different. So let's talk about those that are coming out of forbearance. And I wanna, I wanna go to one slide here that's come from the Home Price Expectation Survey. And they asked this question, for each of the possible uh, post forbearance outcomes, what percentage of these 2.7 million homeowners do you estimate will? So the first uh, you know, piece of the pie there, that blue area, 58%, they'll resume their mortgage payments and stay in their home for at least another year. That's 1.57 million people, You know, the, the majority of those people. Those are people that I, I say, you know, they took forbearance out, maybe they needed it, maybe they didn't. It did the job that it was intended to do. They could have been affected by, a, a, you know, loss of a job or, or a pause in a job. They could have, uh, you, you know, had a business that was disrupted but they were able to get to the other side, stay in their home and, and, and really experience no issues, I'm gonna say, relative to their, their house, okay? The next piece of the pie, 24% uh, in the green area there, you see they will list their home within one year of exiting forbearance. So I think about these people, 648,000 people, a significant number of people um, in this bucket. Now, we, we say within one year of exiting forbearance, remember forbearance started in March of last year and people enrolled throughout the year, certainly a lot on the front end, but these people will roll off as the year progresses. It's in one, one moment in time uh, that they'll come off of forbearance. But those are people that say, you know what, we, we uh, made it through to the other side, uh, had some challenges, went through maybe a workout with our bank and you know they tacked the payments onto the end of the loan or whatever they did to work that out. And, um, you know, we tried to stay in the home, but you know what, we can't afford it, we need to sell it. We have equity in the home, so we don't need to, we're not going into a foreclosure or any type of distressed sale. We're going to be able to take that equity, maybe buy something a little bit cheaper, or whatever the case may be, and move on down the road. A lot of people in that bucket, 648,000, a number, a reason we need to be talking about forbearance, 
uh, in, uh, in our businesses today. The last piece of the, the pie here, the red piece, 18% will receive a foreclosure notice within one year of exiting forbearance. That's 486,000 uh, people, individuals, families that will be affected that way. Now, again, remember, as they roll off, this is into this year and next um, within that year. So we, we have kind of a time span of almost two years uh, that those numbers affect. Now, the key word I want to draw you to here is receive a foreclosure notice. Doesn't say they're going to go into foreclosure. But those are people that, that, that you know, the bank has to come and say, you know what, we tried to make this work and, and it's not working. Okay, you, you've, you've either fallen behind again or we've, we've got a problem here. And those are going to be the people that we're able to help that some, uh, you know, some, some may go into foreclosure that happens in our business every day. We don't wish it upon anyone, but we know it's a fact of, of the matter here in our business. But a lot of those are going to say, you know what, we have significant equity. We need to sell this home and we need to move on. And, and I think keeping that in mind over the next, you know, two years as people come off of forbearance, according to the survey, is a major reason that we need to be talking about this subject. And this is a subject that I, you know, I, I don't know that people are going to come up and knock on our door and say, you know what, we're having trouble. It's one that we need to be talking about and inviting people in to say, you know, if you are having trouble there or you are coming off of forbearance, you need to talk. I want to be somebody who can and help you through that uh, and, and help you get to the other side of this uh, issue caused by the pandemic. Now, I think to, to position this uh, one other way, Odetta David, Cushy- David, is, before a, you go on, go just ahead. go back one slide. Okay. I, there was a question that came in about, you know, people losing their jobs and how is that gonna impact the market? I just want okay. everyone to understand, anyone who lost their job, all right? You know, I feel for that family. I feel for that person in the whole situation. I'm not making light of that situation. And I understand that not everyone who lost their job was working at McDonald's. There are pilots, there are flight attendants, there are people who work for the airlines that lost their jobs too. Very high paying jobs. So I'm not trying to make like an overall brush this away thing. But I will tell you that the vast majority of the people who lost their jobs because of this pandemic we're in the service industry making minimal wages, the vast majority. That's why it did not impact the real estate market overall this year. That's why we were able to sell more houses this year than we sold last year. And if we had more inventory across the country, those numbers would even be higher, the amount of houses we sold. So if we take a look at the jobs report that came out just last Friday, the headline was we lost 140 jobs, and that's true. But that's the overall in all the different categories. In just leisure and hospitality, people who are working in the restaurants, waiters, waitresses, and I'm not saying they're not homeowners, but the vast majority of them are not homeowners. All right. 480,000 jobs were lost there. That means in the rest of all the other sectors, we gained 340,000 uh, 340, jobs. So when we're talking about the jobs report and we're talking at the numbers, and if you're a KCM member, we go over this every single month. We give you great information on this, all right? So you can really talk intelligently and articulately about it. But the job market, every economist is saying, this is not impacting the housing market the way it, it other um, times of great job loss has because it's really skewed to what they call the service industry. They call this a service recession. People in the service industry, meaning people who work at a bartenders, people who work in restaurants. And again, I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not saying my heart doesn't go out to them because they can't afford their rent payment or their mortgage payment. I'm not saying that none of them own a home, but the vast majority that got laid off don't. So uh, for the people, the person who asked a question about the job market, that would be my answer. It's the reason it didn't impact it this year, uh, this past year in 2020, is the same reason it's not gonna impact it going forward. People in the service industry, they're the ones mostly losing their jobs. And what do we know as soon as everyone's vaccinated? What do we know immediately is going to happen once we do hit the end of that tunnel and see the light again? 
Every one of us is going out for a steak dinner or a veal cutlet parmesan dinner to our favorite Italian restaurant, to our favorite steakhouse, and we're going to leave a great tip that day. That's not going to make up for all the time, but I will tell you this. My wife has already told me we're going out to dinner five nights a week for a solid year after she's cooked dinner every night for a solid year. All right. So we know that that's going to come back strong, too, as we get through this time. Sorry, David, I didn't mean to make that. No, it's a great point. And I think, Steve, having those answers when people ask those questions, you know, about job loss and about that is what what we want to give you here. And, you know, another one of those uh, those answers is is what I was talking about with Odetta Cushy here. She does such a good job. Uh, Deputy Chief Economist at First American. And this really articulates and kind of encapsulates, if that's the right word, what we're talking about here. She says this, the foreclosure process is based on two steps. First, the homeowner suffers an adverse economic shock. We've got that right here, leading to the homeowner to become delinquent on their mortgage. However, delinquency by itself is not enough to send a mortgage into foreclosure. With enough equity, a homeowner has the option of selling their home or tapping into their equity through a refinance to help weather the economic shock. It's a lack of sufficient equity and the second component of the dual trigger that causes a serious delinquency to become a foreclosure. I think that that really sums up where we're at right now uh, in the country. Certainly we have adverse economic, economic shock brought on by the pandemic, but we have significant equity in homes. And, and I think we need to be talking about that. Do you know how much equity you have in your home? Whether you want to, you, you've been affected by the pandemic through forbearance, or you want to leverage that equity to, to something that meets your family's needs in the future. But, but, but really, I think where, uh, where, where this, um, you know, this idea of how will foreclosures or how will forbearance uh, affect the market in the coming year, Lawrence Unit NAR says it this way, any foreclosure increases will likely be quickly absorbed by the market and it will not lead to any price declines. You know, I think that that is one area that we can help people right now uh, in seeing the, the truth of what's happening in forbearance and, and how that's going to play out in the market. You know, I want to want to go through just a couple more slides and give you a couple uh, other insights before I turn it uh, back over to Steve. And, and really, this is a topic, a challenge that we face in U.S. real estate across this country. And I know in the nuance and what Steve talked about in, in your market right now, some of you are facing this challenge and some of you aren't. And this is a picture of the year over year change in listings. And while, you know, we're bringing listings to market across the country, the total number of listings has stayed low. Literally homes are being purchased as quickly as they come to market. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, no doubt the underscoring of this is our job right now is to bring those listings uh, to market. And again, if you want more information on that, the trends that are going to help you do that, go and watch the, the webinar that we did uh, for KCM yesterday talking about this very subject. But, but a couple of things I want to remind you of that I think you probably know or sense, but, but give you some perspective on that. And the first comes from homes.com from David Maley, who's the president there. He says this, the surge in work from home population has rewritten the playbook for many home buying and rental decisions from when and where people are willing or are looking to relocate to what people are looking for in their next residence. And what do we know? Through the pandemic, many people have had to work from home. Many people are required to work from home. Some of those can't work. And, you know, we, we certainly feel for those uh, those people, but no doubt this past year has rewritten the rules to, to what can be accomplished at home. Even look at what we're doing here on a Zoom call. Steve and I are able to communicate with people from both of our homes and, and many of you maybe in your home right now. And, and so I, I think as we look at that, we know it's going to have an impact on the market. NAR says by 2022 that, you know, where we started in this, that twice the number of people will be working from home. And, and the word here for 2021 is more people will get clarity about that and clarity about what their job is going to require. Are you going to be required to be in the office, you know, uh, five days a week or, or two days a week? Are you going to be able to work from home, uh, you know, all the time or, you know, all of that is going to become clearer as we come out of this pandemic, which is going to mean people are going to say, okay, I may not have to live 
where I live right now. I may not have to do what I've done or may want to get closer to, you know, maybe a family member or whatever the case may be or move somewhere altogether. And I think us being a part of that conversation with people uh, is going to be critically important this year. You know, another quote that came uh, from homes.com, I think it articulates where we are is this home feature preferences have shifted substantially during the pandemic with 78% of real estate professionals citing client requests for home offices as the number one change, but followed by larger square footage, outdoor spaces, pools, hot tubs, decks, and upgraded kitchens. These adjustments illustrate the effect of today's work from home and e-learning needs to create a practical and comfortable living environment. No doubt, you know, the ability to, to be in your homes more, living life more uh, in home, having kids maybe that are going to school, parents that are working, everything that we know is the reality and the challenge of today, I think it's gonna cause a lot of people and is causing a lot of people to rethink home. And, you know, I, I don't think uh, you know, maybe everybody's saying, hey, um, we expect this, uh, you know, to, to turn out a certain way. But I think they're thinking, you know, what, if that were to happen again, I want a home that meets our needs for what we what, what we could experience. If, if our kids had to, you know, uh, go to school from home, if I had to work from home, the things that I would want if I had the choice to, to choose those. And we're certainly seeing that as a trend in what people are requesting for um, uh, in that. You know, really to to, to kind of kind of hit this one last time, uh, Robert Dietz from the National Association of Home Builders. Certainly, we're seeing home builders uh, home builder confidence has been extremely high as we tailed out the end of the year. Uh, even partial persistence from work from home options will expand buyer purchasing options. The National Home Association of Home Builders data shows 61% of workers believe they'll be able to telecommute on at least a partial basis after the vaccine is deployed. And while less than one third of the workforce has been working at home, any reduction in traffic reduces the commute time and cost for all workers. So this comes from directly from the National Association of Home Builders. And th th they're confident, you know, uh, builder confidence is at an all time high, starts at an all time high, permits at an all time high. Uh, a builder saying, you know what, the option for people today to design what they want in a home uh, is what many people are looking for and doing it a number of different ways. You know, I think the, the, the one thing that, that I want to I want to leave you with here as we talk through this is, um, you know, what is the reality uh, of, of the market right now with appreciation and interest rates and, and what we see coming into the future? And this is a, an example that our team put together of, you know, January 2021, the interest rate, if you look at $500,000 financed, the principal and interest payment there is $2,015. If we advance that to 2022 and we take the, the NAR examples of certainly the top end of where we could be of 5.7% appreciation and 3.4% uh, in, a, in a mortgage rate, a good rate there, that principal and interest payment is $2,344 a net difference of $329. That'll shock someone who's, who's out there looking to buy a home right now. And so I think our, our message is to get out there and say, okay, interest rates are projected to be in the threes going into next year. Appreciation is projected to be you know, healthy across the country, but here's the real impact that's gonna have. And so whatever you, you, you wait to buy will just cost you more as you go throughout the year. And, and, and I think our job is to get that message in front of people because here's really what's at stake. What's at stake going forward is the equity for individuals and families to earn over the next five years. If you take a $500,000 loan amount and, and you, you, what the Home Price Expectation Survey says about equity coming in the next five years, that family stands to, to grow in wealth and earning $90,000, I shouldn't say earning, grow the, that equity, that wealth uh, by $90,000, 368. And so I, I think looking at that and saying, okay, how do we help more people get into homes that want to and take advantage of uh, the, the low interest rates that, that are out there, take advantage of, um, of maybe a, a need that they have for their family so that um, they can begin to earn that equity, grow that, uh, that, that piece of their lives is really what 
uh, what I think it's all about today and, and the job that we have in the market. So before I turn it over to Steve, uh, we would love to have you join us on the journey at KCM. You can go to try KCM. You know, I spend about 10 or 15 minutes every Monday morning with KCM members talking about topics just like this on a deep dive. So you have an understanding of just what's happening in the real estate market and you're able to communicate that to the clients you serve. We, if you haven't done it, we'd love to invite you on it and, uh, and, and you can check it out for a couple of weeks and see if it's right for you. So uh, certainly want to invite that, uh, invite you to join us on that journey. So Steve, I, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to close us out. Sure. Well, I just wanted to say to everyone, thank you very much for taking your time. I know you've invested an hour of your life in a crazy time of, in, in history in order to do that. Uh, David, is my picture up there to you? Yes. Oh, okay. So I just want everyone to, to, to realize I appreciate your time. David and I both appreciate your time that you gave us today. And, and I want to look back when I first became an agent back to over 30 years ago. I was working in, at a, a major corporation with a really good job, and I decided I was going to leave that job to enter the field of real estate. And I went to my father. You know, I'm very, very lucky. Probably the smartest person I've ever met in my life was my own pop. And I said, Dad, I don't know if this is a good idea or not a good idea, but I already left my other job, and I'm going to be in real estate commission sales now. And I want to make sure I'm successful. You know, what advice do you have for me? And he asked me, well, how exactly does the real estate business work? I said, well, I get paid a commission. I said, he, and he said, you get a paid a commission on what? I said, every transaction I do. So he said, so every time you help somebody buy a house, you get paid. I, I said, yes. And every time you help someone sell that house, you get paid. I said, yep. And the more people that you help, the more you get paid. And I said, well, yeah, my income will go up if I have more transactions. He said, then this is really, really simple. Don't worry about the money. Worry about the people sitting across the table from you. Because really, you're getting paid by helping people. So just help as many people as you can. And that really just changed my life, to be frank with you. Because I never, no longer looked at the business about my bank account or how much money I was going to make or how much my family was going to prosper for my success. Instead, I looked at the families across the table from me and how their bank account was going to be affected and how their family was going to prosper based on what help I gave them. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, there's never been a greater time in our country's history that people need help right now. We're in the middle still of a pandemic. We have social unrest greater than any time since the Civil War. They're confused. We can't help them medically unless we could give them a good recommendation to a doctor. We can't help them through that social unrest. But what we can do is help them on the real estate side of their lives, whether they're buying or selling a home. We can help them there. So what I would suggest very strongly is think about that person, that family sitting on the other side of the table. And that's the only thing you should be thinking about at every appointment. You should try to get in front of as many people as you can and think about them when you get there. If you're in Brooklyn, you might be sitting with your current listings, those families, those families who already have entrusted you to sell their home. And you might have to have a tough discussion with them. But if they want to sell right now, they might have to adjust their price. And that's going to be a tough conversation. I get that. But again, it's not about your feelings or how you feel about yourself at the end of the day. It's about whether or not you help them. And if that's the advice they have to hear, they're trusting you, you have to be the people giving them that advice. On the opposite end, if you're in, you know, Eastern Suffolk County and you have 17 offers on one of your homes, all right? Make sure that that homeowner is not necessarily picking the highest number, but the best deal. And if you're one of the, the agents that have one of those 17 offers, make sure that your client understands that we're in a totally different market right now and they probably will have to pay probably over asking price. Let them understand that, teach them, counsel them. Because David just showed us if they wait a year, it's going to cost them a fortune, both in equity and in how much more they're going to be paying in a mortgage. So think about the person on the other side of the table. We just got a question from someone right on the Queens Nassau border. Well, Steve, what happens if somebody owns a two family home 
and their tenant can no longer afford to pay their rent. Therefore, they can no longer afford to pay the mortgage. Well, there's a family that needs help. If you're talking to that family, make sure you explain to them. Is it a legal second family, you know, second unit in your house? If it's legal and, and everything is there, and ladies and gentlemen, I grew up on Long Island. You know, I lived on Long Island a long time. Did real estate for over 25 years on Long Island. I know a lot of them aren't legal. But if it's legal, they should go right to the bank and ask for forbearance and talk to them about, this is what I need right now. These are the challenges I'm up against. What can we do to work this out? If it's not a legal second unit, then you might have to talk to them about the fact that, well, if you can't afford to pay the mortgage right now, it's better to sell your house and get whatever equity you have in it than to lose the house because you can't make the mortgage payments. Again, tough decisions, tough conversations. But I've always argued, good agents know how to deliver good news. Great agents know how to deliver difficult news. Be a great agent right now. No matter what part of Long Island you're in or what part, what county you're in. I don't care if you're in Kings County in Brooklyn, Queens, did Nassau or Suffolk, those families in front of you need your help. Help them. Now, I get it across those four counties. They might need help in different ways. That's okay. Just figure out what they need and deliver that. That's been the secret to our success in real estate. My whole career, probably in a whole 200 years, 200 something years this country has been around. That hasn't changed. The need for them to see us as a trusted advisor that can help them hasn't lessened over the last 18 months. It has accelerated that need for us. We have to step up and answer that need. And the simple way, go back to what my father said. Don't worry about you. Worry about that family sitting across the table from you. Thanks, Steve. Marianne, we'll turn it back over to you. Um, thank you for, for having Steve and I on today. Thank you. Um, what great, great information. Um, I, I, all the work that you both did to bring us the customized data, um, the reach out to all of the different companies and uh, to bring the perspective that you did. And then of course, Steve closing us out with remembering who we are and what we do. So um, thank you so very much. And um, to all of the realtors who are listening, this will be the um, KCM is allowing us to record this and this will be posted on LIBOR's um, hub, which is lirealtor.com forward slash COVID. And you can see this webinar, recorded webinar, and I think they share the slides as well with us. Yeah, I'll send those to you, Marianne. There was a question about the uh, the math on the uh, appreciation and the higher mortgage rate. We'll give you the slides. You'll see all that there. If somebody has a question, certainly can reach out uh, to us on that. Somebody okay. asked about what time the deep dive was. We do it at 11 a.m. on Monday mornings. Uh, so love to have you there. Okay, and that's trykcm.com. Yeah. All right. Okay. Trykcm.com. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much. Be well, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity, Marianne. Go out there and kill it, guys. Go out and do what you need to do. Okay. Bye-bye.